All right, turning now to tensions over the North American Free Trade Pact, as Donald Trump has said, he wants to renegotiate the deal when it comes up for review in 2026. Ontario Premier Doug Ford is suggesting that Mexico should be cut from the agreement because he says that country is a backdoor for Chinese goods entering North America. What I'm proposing to the federal government, we do a bilateral trade deal with the U.S. And if Mexico wants a bilateral trade deal with Canada, God bless them. But I'm not going to be uh, drawn down with these cheap imports taking men and women's jobs from hardworking Ontarians. Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland says she's heard similar concerns about Mexico's policies towards China, and she shares them. Now, I have been hearing for some time from people close to the incoming Trump administration, but also from other American business leaders and indeed from members of the outgoing Biden administration, some concerns that Mexico is not acting the way that Canada and the US are when it comes to its economic relationship with China. And I do have some sympathy with those concerns we've heard from our American counterparts. Juan Carlos Baker is the former Vice Minister for International Trade for Mexico and former USMCA negotiator. Mr. Baker, it's good to see you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me, David. Good afternoon. I, I wonder, sir, if I could get your response to, to the Premier of Ontario, Doug Ford, saying that Mexico should maybe be excluded from North America trade because of its misalignment with uh, the U.S. and Canada on China. Um, well, those are comments um, unfortunate, to say the least. I believe that the comments uh, made by the Premier do not reflect the reality of uh, North American trade. Uh, right now, the numbers are there. Mexico is the largest trading partner of the United States. In that case, uh, that means that Mexico actually trades more with the United States and Canada or Japan or any other country for that matter. Uh, and those remarks also uh, reflect or do not take into account rather that the trade that occurs within North America, it's a trade that occurs under the rules of the USMCA, meaning that those products traded comply with what is called the rules of origin, right. meaning that each product has a regional value content that it was pre-recorded and pre-agreed in the agreement. So those comments are really misplaced because Mexico has done its part. And in my mind, at least, there is no doubt that the USMCA is strong because Mexico, Canada, and the United States trade together. So, so you reject the allegation that Mexico is essentially allowing itself to be used as a backdoor for China to get into the North American market, that, that, that products that Canada and the U.S. have applied tariffs against are not landing in Mexico, being relabeled and shipped into the, the northern partners? So you don't, that is not true in your view? Those, those, uh, those comments are absolutely false and unfounded. As I just said, everything that is traded within North America complies with the rules of origin. And uh, there's also another clarification that I would like to make. Mexico has actually increased its tariffs as well, vis-a-vis -vis products coming uh, into my country from third countries, including China. And we have actually increased those uh, tariffs twice in the last year. So right now, products coming from China are paying tariffs as high as 50% or higher in some cases. So those allegations that Mexico has itself allowed to be uh, this springboard uh, for Chinese products is not only false, but it's also, I believe, very dangerous because it's, uh, in a way, misplacing the conversation that we should be, ha be having in North America. Right. And clearly, again, uh, what's been related is just not true. Okay, uh, so the federal government does not want to kick Mexico out of the uh, uh, Kuzma, USMCA, NAFTA 2.0, whatever you want to call it. But the Deputy Prime Minister, Christian Freeland, who you would well know was a key part of the renegotiations last time around, she just had a news conference here in Ottawa a little while ago, and she said she's heard these concerns from the Biden administration, from U.S. business leaders, some real concerns about whether Mexico is fully aligned when it comes to its policies vis-a-vis -vis China. And I think those are legitimate concerns for American partners and neighbors to have, and those are concerns I share. So this is Christian Freeland, who I assume knows the trade agreement far better than the Ontario Premier because this was uh, her mission for several years. What do you make of the Deputy Prime Minister making comments like that, saying that she also shares concerns about Mexico's conduct here? I haven't really seen those remarks by Deputy Prime Minister Freeland, but I'm taking you 
uh, on your word on those. And what I would say is that there are legitimate concerns about how China has entered North America, not only Mexico, but North America as well. Because if we go down at the numbers, we will see that China continues to invest and to trade with Canada, with the US and with Mexico, trying to single out Mexico really as just the weakest link in this uh, equation and trying to portray Mexico as the sole responsible for that. To me, again, not only is misplaced, but also it takes away the attention from the issue that we should be addressing. Now, having said that, of course, uh, I also believe that uh, each country, uh, Ottawa, Mexico City, and Washington DC must define what is that alignment that we should be seeking uh, towards China and leave enough room for each country to pursue its own policy. Uh, having a trade agreement certainly brings us together and it's a, a, an incentive for cooperation. But we must take into account also the domestic dynamics in each of the countries. And in any case, if those are legitimate concerns, as Deputy Prime Minister Freeland says, the USMCA has the tools and the means to address those concerns, either through audits, either through making sure that uh, goods that do not comply with the origin pay the tariffs and so on. I believe that suggesting that eliminating one partner will magically uh, somehow reduce that trade with China, well, that is just, in my mind, not, mm. not really uh, framing the issue correctly. Yeah, and look, I, I want to reiterate, Doug Ford's uh, position that maybe Mexico should be kicked out is not Christian Freeland's position. She does have concerns about how Mexico, you know, is aligned when it comes to trade policies, but she is not calling for the breakup of the trade arrangement. But you can see already, uh, uh, Mr. Baker, that Donald Trump isn't even in office, and already we're in this cycle of pretty extreme disruption, right? Uh, that, that's where this is going, in that he's promising, like, a general tariff of up to 20 percent. There's some reporting in Politico that Robert Lighthizer is working maybe with congressional leadership to try to have Congress bring in the tariffs and, finan and to, to finance uh, uh, corresponding tax cuts as a way of baking it into congressional control. It, it seems that the U.S. is intent on big changes, no matter what the rules of engagement are under the agreement that Donald Trump wanted and called the best trade agreement in the world. Where do you think this goes? I do believe that uh, there are changes that we are going to be seeing. I believe that the USMCA and Donald Trump 2024, 2025 are just not the same that we faced seven, eight years ago. So in that sense, the USMCA, in my opinion, has been very successful. But the USMCA needs to do a better job in terms of adapting to today's realities. So mm -hmm. what you were saying, David, about uh, uh, Deputy Minister, uh, Prime Minister Freeland's remarks about China, those also are remarks that are picked up here in Mexico. <laughs> what do North America does about climate change? How can we do a better job in terms of supply, uh, supply chain reliability and so on? So clearly, there will be changes. That, that I am uh, very certain of it. I am just... Uh, not sharing the view, as some commentators are saying in Washington and in other places. Uh, I just don't share the view that uh, you need to break the USMCA to make it better. I actually believe that the whole process of the review in 2026 is actually going to be a very good opportunity to upgrade, to right. enhance the effectiveness of the USMCA without breaking it. So, so just as a final question, uh, uh, Mr. Baker, I, I mean, the last time Donald Trump seemed intent on reopening NAFTA to renegotiate it so that he could show a win because he wanted to prove that he was a deal maker um, and, and, and achieve some victory there. But now if you look at the reporting of what we're hearing and the promise of a 20 percent global tariff and a maybe 60 percent or more when it comes to China, that's, uh, we don't even know if Canada and Mexico are going to be affected by that or brought inside those tariff walls because of the USMCA. But there is a real possibility, it seems, that this trade agreement could be torn up by the U.S., is it not? Do you see it as that extreme if they want to go this tariff route? Well, I, I do see the risk on a, a much more protectionist view mm. and policies by the United States. Uh, as you, David, I have seen those remarks by President Trump. Uh, he's been very vague about it. Sometimes he says 10 percent, sometimes he says 20, sometimes he says 60. Right. Uh, there's no, there's no doubt in my mind that if he does that, well, I, I cannot speak for the Canadian government, of course, but I have heard President Sheinbaum in Mexico and, and uh, Secretary Marcelo Brad stating that, well, we don't really want to take any decision that goes against the USMCA, but we will look at the legal means available to us. 
to guarantee that the USMCA is support. So in that sense, I um, clearly would regret if there is a trade war in North America. Uh, certainly. And Mexico will not begin one, will not uh, start one, uh, but uh, the, the possibilities of having a rough time ahead with some, you know, a few fires uh, shot in each direction, that is a very real possibility. Now, in the end, after all of that, and you might remember, David, how mm. the original USMCA negotiation was, we had about two years where uncertainty was the common element every day. Uh, I believe that just on this occasion, as much as it was back then, we will manage to secure a result. In my mind, there is no a scenario where the USMCA or North America, for that matter, will break up. Right. There will be hard times. There will be moments that we need to make decisions. There will be other occasions on which the chips might be falling elsewhere. Uh, but in the end, what we have is just too precious uh, to let it fail. I, I just don't see that scenario. Juan Carlos Baker, former Vice Minister for International Trade for Mexico. It's good to see you, sir. Thank you for being here today. My pleasure. Our economic relationship with the United States is strong. It is mutually beneficial. If anything, it is on a firmer footing today than it was before the renegotiation of the NAFTA trade agreement. Despite those reassurances, one Canadian senator wants Ottawa to relaunch an advisory group that helped during the last round of negotiations. Hassan Youssef is an independent senator, and he was part of that NAFTA council when he was president of the Canadian Labour Congress, and he joins me now from Toronto. Senator, it's good to see you again. Thanks for being here. Thank, thank you, David. Thanks for having me. Do you have an overwhelming sense of deja vu? Christian Freeland talking about sitting home with Donald Trump to save the trade relationship between Canada and the U.S. What are your thoughts on where this is going? Well, a lot has changed uh, from four years ago, but it seems like we're back to the same place where we started, except that um, we do have a negotiated new agreement. And I think for the most part, since that agreement has been renegotiated, I think for all three countries, I think the agreement has worked very well. I think there are issues that probably has arise from, depends on where you're looking at, that might uh, require some attention. But beside that, I think, um, the president can feel proud of what he did in the renegotiations, and, and so could all Canada and Mexico for that part. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, until we know exactly what they're talking about, we shouldn't speculate too much because I think there's many things we can point to in the renegotiated agreement has worked very well since we re renegotiated the agreement. But, well, you know, yes, uh, you, there is a lot of uncertainty. You make a very good point there, but that is the nature, I think, of a Donald Trump presidency, and we can say that after four years of, of lived experience on that. He is talking about tariffs of 10 percent, 20 percent. We don't know if it applies to Canada. We don't know if it applies to Mexico. So, so you know that having been part of the, the national, uh, sorry, the NAFTA Council last time with people like James Moore and, 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 other, and Ron Ambrose and others, the value of it. I mean, do you restart it now or do you wait until 2026 when you get the official renegotiation? What, what's your vision of, of how a reconstituted council might work here? Well, I think the country should be prepared. We're going to have to have some advisory uh, group helping the government uh, uh, manage this challenge that they're going to, they're going to be faced with. And uh, bringing Canadians together at that level, I think, is beneficial to the country. Equally as is beneficial for what we will engage with the Americans, I think the opportunity to have a broad set of voices from different parts of society and be united in our, our common approach for the greater good of the country, I think is fundamental in how uh, we should approach uh, whatever might come with this new presidency. And of course, um, what he may decide he wants to do with his tariff or renegotiating of the USMC, but we may have other issues that people can provide, I think, advice to the government that would be of maximum uh, benefit to them, hear, hearing those voices, but also able to unite um, different sectors of the country, uh, but the greater good of why we need to stick together and be strong and how we approach the administration. Because we might be in this, of course, for the next four years. And of course, it looked like it would be a very different approach from the last time around. The president has got more experience this time around, and he's bringing some people so far that are very tough in their outlook around the world. So we're going to have to figure out how we balance that and try to mitigate uh, Canada's interests in the long term. So there's a lot at mm. stake, but equally, 
we've got a lot of good people in this country who wants to commit and help the government succeed in this effort to protect the country. Well, well, so a lot of those people and some of those people have been part of the, the Team Canada effort that they launched sort of at the beginning of this year in anticipation of this possible outcome. Um, but, you know, we don't really know fully what the Trump cabinet will be, though it's starting to take shape pretty rapidly. I don't know if the Trudeau government will reshape its cabinet to sort of respond to whatever happens in the United States. That was certainly what happened last time around in terms of putting people in different roles. I mean, but to, how quickly do you think you need something like the Na a new NAFTA Council in place? Do, do you allow cabinet to deal with it right now or do you start this more formal process ASAP and, and get it going across the border? Well, I think they should do it sooner rather than later. I think what you want to do is to build this energy and rapport among the council members if you have a similar kind of structure because uh, people may know each other in passing, but when you're working around the table, I think the dynamics change and change in a very significant way. Mm. We need to have a common view in terms of the problem we're faced with and equally, uh, hopefully, a united approach in how we're going to address those issues. So the sooner the government could do that, I think uh, we be better off, but also it sends a message to the, the whole country, including premiers and other political leaders across the country, that Canada is prepared for this. We're united in our effort to ensure that our best interests will be be looked after. But equally, we've got a multitude of Canadians from a, uh, many walks of life who are prepared to assist us going forward. And I think the last NAFTA council that the government did create, it was incredible value to the government, but equal value for the people who were involved in the NAFTA Council recognized. We all have issues we want to complain about, but ultimately, can we find some common ground which we can agree to protect the country and equally succeed in whatever renegotiations we might have with the Americans? And I think it did work, and I think we are proud of what we did, and the country benefited enormously as a result of that. The way the NAFTA Council uh, functioned and sort of the approach last time was to sort of, you know, do, do uh, values-based and value-based negotiations, you know, keep it very focused on the bottom line. We've seen the Ontario government come out, though, Premier Doug Ford saying uh, Mexico is not living up to the deal. Let's kick Mexico out of the, uh, out of the North American Free Trade Agreement um, if they're not willing to align themselves with Canada and the U.S. Uh, on China. We've, we've spoken to a former Mexican minister earlier in the show who says Ford's claims are, are kind of baseless. But do you think it's helpful to have the Premier of Ontario out making a statement like that at, at this point in, in the transition south of the border? Well, I think we need to be a little bit careful because we can all throw stones at each other in regard to what aspect of the relationship or, or working or not working. I think we need to be specific. I think certainly they have an issue raised about China gaining access to the American market, mm -hmm. uh, which was not part of the agreement. Uh, and if that's the case, as I think has been documented, I think uh, Mexico is going to have to fix that problem uh, going forward. Um, and if they're not prepared to do that, obviously, we'll have to determine how we deal with that issue. But at the end of the day, I think uh, we need to at least try not to, I think, come at this uh, trying to throw somebody under the bus. I think we're all going to have to look at this, how we work together. And I think we know for certain where we're going. I don't think we should be making uh, um, you know, statement that could be inflammatory or might be interpreted the wrong way that uh, may cause more grief in the long term. We have got a good relationship with the United States, but so we have a good relationship with Mexico also at the same time. In your uh, previous uh, career as the head of the Canadian Labour Congress, you were part of the NAFTA Council to represent the views of workers and, and, and unions and, and fight for labour standards. What do you think Canada needs to be doing on this point now with Trump signaling um, you know, trade disruption at minimum and maybe renegotiating the agreement to, to make sure that workers uh, in specific sectors aren't affected too badly by this? Well, I think we need to remind the Americans, if there's anything that's, uh, when it comes to labor standards, we have higher standards than, there, than them to begin with. First of all, uh, we apply ourselves to all of the ILO, most of the ILO convention, and we live up to those standards. We have never been, you know, accused by the Americans of breaching our responsibility to protect workers in our country. At the same time, I think the agreement, the renegotiated UMC, USMCA, um, actually have elevated the standards of Mexican workers. Granted, there's still more work to be done. Mm -hmm. But Mexican workers, for the first time, are able to choose a democratic union. They're able to, of course, to vote in their collective agreement. And we did put a rapid response in the agreement that if there are some issues that affect workers, they can be dealt with much quicker than waiting for months on end for some NAFTA tribunal to rule. But I think at the end of the day, um, going into this set of relationship with the Americans, I think will require us to really be clear 
that there are other issues that may compound our challenges. Of course, we've got a border with the Americans we're gonna to have to manage in a very uh, uh, independent way. Equally, of course, they're gonna to wanna to talk about security issues, which we're committed to, because we're, made, uh, we're, we're a, a, a country that's committed to, to, to NORAD and, and of right. course, the Northern security. But there's a number of things that are gonna come up in the agreement and you want people around the table that can bring uh, some experience, but also bring some um, appreciation of things that we need to consider as a country, but also as Canadians that will strengthen our country, but equally so strengthen our relationship with the Americans at the same time. I, I have one last question for you, sir, on, on a domestic issue. Uh, as a former head of the Canadian Labor Congress, we have seen the federal labor minister now refer labor disputes of ports and railways after a lockout to the Labor Relations Board for, or Industrial Relations Board for binding arbitration. Is that a move that tilts the, uh, the playing field in favor of employers in disputes like this? What, what are your thoughts on, on that choice by Stephen McKinnon? Well, it's always worrisome when, you know, workers are, are, are asked to go to a binding arbitration to resolve the collective agreement. This is a fundamental thing for workers to a large extent. Um, and rightfully so, workers and unions shouldn't really like that. Unfortunately, of course, um, the minister is using a provision that's in the code, and of course, um, he has a right to do so, but doesn't mean that the worker should accept that. Mm. Collective bargaining is fundamental, and we should try to figure out a way how we can make collective bargaining function more effectively where employers are not relying on the government to try to solve a dispute when, when uh, you know, party gets uh, uh, intractable in, in regard to whatever the issues might be. But at the same time, um, I think there's a recognition that you know, workers are going to challenge these provisions in the court. We'll see what the court decides in regard to what is violate your charter rights in regard to the right to strike. And um, ultimately, this section of the code, um, you know, right. was agreed to by all three parties when it was uh, rewritten back in the 90s. Independent Senator Hassan Youssef, thank you so much for your time today, sir. Appreciate it. Always, my friend. Thank you so much for having me.